These are the super early birds for CES unveiled. It starts at five and they're here at four an hour early. But we want to go to the what to watch. This is going to happen all night so, uh, for a while. Unveiled, starts at five. But this is good, what to watch. It's the analysts. So all the people who are doing all the analysis. This is about to start. Cap, you We have a whole lot to cover in 45 minutes to do so, so Steve, we should probably get started. <laughs> okay, I, I'm Leslie's boss, but as you can tell, she really gets the orders, you know, so. Usually. All right. Well, let's start with a question, because uh, when, when you come to CES, where a lot of people are looking for perspective, so so here's some, here's some good stuff. So when we look across the consumer technology industry and the overall ecosystem today, how can we describe that dynamic? So I want you to think about hardware, you think there any devices, seats? software, so apps, even content, media, entertainment, these things, social media. How can we describe the dynamic? Well, in the previous decade, I think the answer would be probably IoT, the Internet of Things. And of course, this is a term that we're all intimately familiar with, for better or worse. Uh, but we, we invoke routinely in business conversations and technology descriptions. But folks, what's happening now in this new decade, and what can we expect to happen as the next 10 years unfolds? Well, I think the answer is, is that we're increasingly confronted with an entirely new IoT, and that is the intelligence of things. Yes. Let me say that again. This new IoT is the intelligence of things. And maybe the best part is we don't have to use a new term. <laughs> Uh, we can still say IoT, but we just mean something a little bit different, don't we? And this new IoT, the intelligence of things, bears testimony to the extent that artificial intelligence is permeating every facet of our commerce and our culture. Now, commerce is pretty well understood, and, and we endorse that as we want to advance our economies uh, around the world. The culture, that's really interesting. As a researcher, to me, that's really interesting. Why? because we're talking about technology's influence on human behavior. Really interesting, and those narratives will certainly be present at CES 2020 and will continue to unfold as we move forward in this new decade. Happy New Year, by the way. Uh, Leslie, but it's true, as much as we're adding intelligence across the technology ecosystem and the broader economy, we're still pushing ahead on that connectivity agenda, aren't we? Yeah, that's right. So 5G is one of those ingredient technologies that is really powering the intelligence of things. Kicking off the decade, we're seeing over 50 networks worldwide deploying their networks with 5G capability. Special to CES this year, we're going to be joined by Christiana Aman, who is Qualcomm's president this Wednesday for a, a special CES super session where he'll discuss all of the exciting activities happening in this new world of 5G. Now, according to our CTA forecast, 5G handset shipments are starting to roll out really in 2020. So 2020 is an inaugural year for 5G-enabled handsets. And by 2022, we're expecting the market to actually essentially flip. So two-thirds of the market will instead switch from this 4G focus to a 5G focus for handsets. And as you can see, and as, as I was speaking about on the other slide, as more and more carriers roll out their 5G capabilities, more and more handsets are doing so. So this narrative is going to continue over the next few years. That's exactly right. And it gets better. Because as those networks continue to propagate uh, across the nation, around the world, 
what's really interesting, and this is where you're going to want to lean in a little bit because this is really important to understand, is that we're, as those networks grow and propagate, we're going to unlock more and more potential for the enterprise. Now, 5G, everybody knows that this is the fifth wireless generation, but did you know that it is also the first wireless generation that will eventually be led by enterprise applications? And we can describe these enterprise applications across commercial and industrial sectors really and, and attribute them to two main sectors here on the screen. So massive IoT and critical IoT. Now, what the heck do these things mean? Well, think about massive IoT as those applications where we have lots and lots and lots of endpoints, but little bits of data. Now, maybe that's a temperature reading or a simple on-off orientation. Critical IoT, on the other hand, really deals with fewer endpoints but orders of magnitude above just massive levels of data. So what that looks like is in a scenario where we might have a, a patient remote that is being op well, operated on by a physician who's remote. So that would involve robotics, maybe 4K, maybe 8K video, maybe virtual reality. That's a, that's a pretty heavy lift data-wise, which is why also uh, critical IoT applications tend to be described in more technical terms as URLLC applications or ultra reliable low latency communications. So now you see why it's just easier to say critical IoT. But in any case, again, as these networks propagate, we unlock more and more potential for the enterprise. And as Leslie said, this 5G narrative is just going to continue to unfold as we move forward throughout this decade. Not only in the consumer space, because that's where a lot of the initiatives are starting today, as we bridge from 4G. But as we move forward in 2021, 22, 3, we're going to hear and we're going to and we're going to see more and more of these enterprise applications. And those narratives start here at CES 2020 at the threshold of this new decade. And to illustrate this point, uh, what we really want to talk about is how these these industrial commercial applications uh, really fit into an economic sector that you might not really associate with advanced technology, and that is agriculture. Now, those of you who were with us last year probably saw the uh, John Deere exhibit over at LVCC in South Hall. There's this massive connected harvester. But with 5G, thinking about massive IoT applications, you know, how much longer before this, this farming equipment becomes truly automated and self-driving? Probably not that much longer, maybe in a few years. What's more, thinking about these massive IoT applications, 5G will enable really squadrons of drones festooned with all kinds of different sensors that can fly over massive acreage of, of cultivation looking for different things. Maybe it's plant disease, or in this case, maybe these red areas are where we need more moisture. And so instead of irrigating the entire crop field again, which wastes water, we can simply address the areas that need it most. That saves water, that's better for the environment, that reduces food costs, you get the idea. So it truly is, really, as the slide says, enabling digital tools to solve this very real world problem of food scarcity. Clearly we have a, a lot of hungry mouths to feed. But let me, let me just go ahead and take it a step further and illustrate this point with a view of the 5G farm of the future. Again, agriculture is not a sector that we just readily attribute with advanced technology, but those technologies are here now and they're getting even better and more powerful uh, in the next couple of years. So take a look here. So as I mentioned, we've got connected sensors in the soil and in the sky with the drone example I, I mentioned. We have connectivity on the ground and up in space. More, we have a lot of these automated farming robots, these advanced systems, plowing, tilling, harvesting, what have you, doing their thing. Uh, a lot of the data is computed at the edge, but bigger chunks of that data that need further analysis will be uploaded to the cloud. And those chunks of data will come right back down to our connected farmer here. And what does the farmer have in front of him? He's got a lot of screens. And maybe one of those screens are futures prices. And because the connected farmer has all this advanced technology and his silos are intelligently connected, with predictive analytics, he knows by the end of the week just how much grain he's going to be able to harvest. So today, he can commit to that maybe high futures price. That's pretty powerful. 
And so this is an illustration of, again, about digital tools helping to solve food scarcity, freeing the farmer's time in many ways from having to drive a tractor all day. Uh, you know, that's, that's what a lot of farmers have to do. That's the reality today, but that's gonna change. That frees them up to do other things, maybe plan for the next crop, or even spend more time with their families. How about that? Greg, as we talk about connectivity and all the data that's being inputted, how are we understanding this data? Well, the next ingredient technology we'd like to touch on is artificial intelligence. You're, you're going to see AI prevalent throughout the entire show. And here are just a few examples of how consumers can get their hands on AI currently. So the consumerization of artificial intelligence. The first is machine learning, taking those large data sets and analyzing them in real time. The next are end devices. We see AI going into televisions, to smart home devices, smart lighting devices, making a more energy efficient home. Also into our content services, things like uh, predictive analytics for trying to predict what shows you might like or what music you might want to listen to. AI is a part of that. And of course, emerging technology. When we think of emerging technology, we think AI right out of the box. AI That's right. is it's right. going in that thing. So uh, this is just an example of how the intelligence of things can really be illustrated today with the consumerization of AI. And additionally, Steve spoke about the last 10 years being all about connectivity and the next 10 years being about intelligence. Well, here are a few examples of connected intelligence. The first is how we're upscaling AI chips. These AI chips are allowing us to have things like AK UHD TVs, that high quality, pristine screen and content. The next is facial recognition and biometrics, utilizing these two things within our home. It's providing us with higher security, both for our houses as well as our devices as well, if you think about fingerprint scanning and retinal eye scanning. And also object detection. Last year at CES 2019, Whirlpool debuted their smart oven. We're sure to see a lot more smart appliances on the show floor this year. Things like smart refrigerators, for example. Being able to analyze what's in your fridge and order some of those staple products in real time. And of course, we can't talk about AI without talking about speech recognition. As you know, voice is going into everything. And it's not just our mobile devices. It's not just our, our speakers. It's every product like those uh, smart appliances. Well, it's true, it's true. Yeah. And going a step further, as we think about smart home, we're on the forefront of fulfilling <laughs> that promise of true smart home technology. Here are a few examples that you'll be able to see at CES this year, but everything from smart faucets to smart mirrors to shower systems. So you can turn your water on and off, adjust the temperature, adjust the lighting around your mirror, but what's next for smart homes? Well, we expect in the future that the entire home will be connected. So it's not just devices, it's not just fixtures, it's the home itself. So smart roofing system, smart walls, all of this is what we're expecting for the fulfillment of the smart home of the future. Well, it's true, and just to expand on Leslie's comments, all these solutions that you see here in front of you were at CES 19, these are, these are connected fixtures. So not just one-off devices or installed devices, these are fixtures in the home, like Leslie mentioned with the voice-activated faucet. And we're gonna see even more of these connected and intelligent fixtures at CES 2020. What's the big takeaway? Why is this happening? What we're doing with, when we look at solutions like this, I think we're finally fulfilling the promise of smart home, which is to create those intelligent living spaces that take care of us the occupants instead of the opposite. You can see it happening at CES 2020 through solutions like these and more. Yeah, that's right, Steve. No. Steve, you want fries with your AI? <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, maybe not fries with my uh, AI, but in any case, if you need even more evidence of the extent that AI is permeating every facet of our commerce and culture, very soon, look no further than the drive through at McDonald's. Now, we talk about human-machine partnerships, and, and we can certainly expect more and more of those as we move forward in this decade. But this is really interesting, uh, and, and why is this happening? Well, 
Thinking about the future of work and human-machine partnerships and AI automating different tasks, the person working the drive-thru is, I don't know if anyone's worked in fast food, but they've got a tough job because you know, the, they've, got to, they've got to certainly take the order, they want to get that right, then they have to handle the transaction, they better get that right because they don't want to shortchange anybody, and then they've got to organize the order, don't forget the extra ketchup, you know, and get all that stuff. And by the way, the people coming through, the customers coming through the drive-through are in a hurry just on principle, aren't they? So by adding a little bit of intelligence at that first initial interaction, that first step, of taking the order frees the human worker up to really focus on handling that money transaction, providing better service, making sure, doubly sure, triply sure that the order is correct so there are no mistakes. This is what we're talking about when we talk about human machine partnerships, very pragmatic applications that are gonna continue to unfold as we move forward in this new decade again. And here's another expression of the intelligence of things ordering french fries, or a Coke, or what have Big Mac uh, at the drive-thru. That, too, is the intelligence of things. We also want to talk about content, because content uh, has, has been part of, of the CBS spectrum for, for several years. Uh, content creators, movie studios, social media, all of these. And of course, those of you that are familiar, we, we, we have a lot of these exhibits and certain conference sessions at or at the Aria Hotel we call Tech South or C Space. So this is where it's all happening. But what's the trend? Well just just focusing on there's a lot of streaming con out, content out there, but just focusing on video for a moment. I mean there are no shortage of choices out there. Look, look you've got like Netflix and, and, and Prime Video and Hulu and, and iPlayer and YouTube and, and the list goes on and on and on. And we're all familiar with this. So suffice it to say there's a lot of competition in this streaming media space. So not, not Star Wars, but, but certainly we're hearing more and more about streaming wars. But get ready for the media empire strikes back. I hope you picked up on our Jedi mind trick that we just played on you. But uh, I see, I told you, Leslie, there's some, there's some Star Wars fans in the audience. I told you there would be. I, okay. And bravo, okay. So, well, this is already starting to happen, and many of us are already enjoying the content on Disney Plus and Apple TV Plus, of course, Max and, and NBC Universal. Here at CBS 2020, by the way, they'll be talking about Peacock, their forthcoming service. Why is this stuff happening? Well, these studios want to you know, take back content, yes, but they also want to control the interaction with their audience members and have more of a one-to-one -one relationship instead of licensing all that content out. And we're gonna learn at CES 2020 that really this mosaic of content that we currently manage, as we've established, is it's pretty, pretty complicated, is about to get a lot more granular. Certainly with, with these solutions that we already have with us today and more coming, but there's even more coming. And we're gonna learn about a brand new service called Quibi, which stands for Quick Bytes, and a very important CES keynote featuring Nick Whitman and Jeffrey Katzenberg. Uh, these are the, this is the leadership of, of Quibi. Now, what is Quibi? It's not just another streaming service. It's very different uh, for two reasons. One, it's really focused on short-form content. That's content that's episodic maybe in nature, but really like less than 10 minutes. And Quibi is, is really geared, therefore, to more of a mobile platform. So on-the-go applications, we're gonna learn all about it, when it's gonna become available, how much it costs, perhaps, and more uh, in this keynote coming up this week at CES 2020. So whilst we're having to uh, manage more content and so forth, uh, we're also gonna be spending more because you know, a lot of these things where they add up, and, and I think unfortunately for, for cord cutters, as you start to tally up all these different subscriptions, uh, some of them may right, be right back to uh, where they started with their pay TV bill. But in any case, I mean, thank you for indulging some US data here. But you can see nearly 17 billion in total this year for consumer spending just on SBOT services alone. And it'll continue to grow apace as more and more of these services deploy and we engage with them. So really interesting, but what I started to say is that uh, in this content we're managing more subscription services. The good news is we can enjoy it on progressively larger screens. From your smartphone, of course, but also your TV and of course, Leslie, CES is legendary for, for big screens, and, and we look forward to that each and every year, and CES 2020 is not going
going to disappoint. This is also where I like to talk about 8K. A lot of people say, well, I just barely got my arms around 4K, now here comes 8K. Why is this happening? Well, as you can see from this trend in the U.S. market, I mean, we're, we're getting very close in terms of annual average shipments, uh, the, the screen sizes of shipments, to that 50-inch mark, which is somewhere north of 200 centimeters. Pretty big. Uh, and in fact, in 2017 in the U.S. market, shipments of LCD TVs 70 inches and above eclipsed the 1 million mark. We'll ship up almost 2 million this year. A lot of big screen TVs shipping in the U.S. market, but around the world as well. The U.S. is not the only big screen culture. So 8K is coming in. As you can see, as those screen sizes rise to shore up picture quality at these very, very large displays. And one other point relative to these big displays is that I don't think all of these are destined for living rooms. Really, because I, I'll speak for myself. I don't think my wife's going to let me bring an 80 inch TV into our living room. <laughs> Probably not going to happen. <laughs> Speaking for myself. But B2B applications, video conferencing, digital signage, these are some applications, uh, I think, uh, in many ways for these, these very, very large screens. Yeah, definitely. And continuing with that entertainment trend that we're going to see at the show floor, XR Innovation has really received a facelift over the past few years. Now, when we think of XR, it includes virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality as well. With XR, or VR or hardware, uh, the six degrees of freedom is now the new norm. And what that means is when you're in a virtual world, instead of only being able to look up, down, left, or right, you'll be able to experience the full 360 view around you. With augmented reality, there's so much content that's deploying these days. And augmented reality content is actually expected to surpass that of virtual reality. So that's the data that's overlaying our everyday world. And also, the form factors from AR has changed. So nowadays, the new AR glasses are taking a real um, sleek uh, change in view from what we've seen in the past. And it's not just from a visual perspective, but from an audio augmented reality perspective as well. Now, when we think of these two technologies, businesses are really utilizing these, um, as we saw earlier with the economy taking shape with the 5G influences and the AI influences, there's AR and VR influences in the B2B case as well. So things like workforce training, being able to reenact different scenarios in the workplace, or an architect being able to use AR glasses to design a room in real time just by looking around them. And also at the, at the show floor this year, we're um, launching a new travel and tourism area, and we're expecting to see some AR and VR innovations within that marketplace as well. And this is really exciting because I don't know about you, Steve, but I would love to put on a VR headset and just transfer myself to an island somewhere. Um, sounds, sounds good to me. Yeah, certainly some of those long haul flights, which we, yeah. we recognize many of you took to be here today. So, so yeah, thank you again thank you for that. Uh, for that. <laughs> well, Leslie, one other thing I think that's important, I mean, one of the, the exciting things that I look forward to each and every year at CES is not only the innovation from a technology angle, but new applications for those technologies. And so Leslie was talking about use cases. Uh, and a lot of, whether it's AR or VR, a lot of excitement in the, the commercial industrial space for this brace of technologies. Why? Well, it's not because it's cool and fun. I can tell you that. It's because it's a very competitive marketplace and businesses around the world are looking for an edge. And technology provides that edge. And so time and time again, as illustrated here with this stock picking AR application, we see companies adopting very, very rapidly these advanced technologies to give them that competitive edge. Yep, that's right. This year at CES, we're also going to have a special gaming and esports conference track on the show floor. It'll include some of those VR and AR innovations that we just spoke of, but a lot of manufacturers are now getting in this space. It's rapidly growing. For example, esports in 2019 experienced a $1 billion uh, revenue and with the new immersive technology need for these gamers more manufacturers are creating uh, better graphics cards uh, special gaming uh, microphones and headsets that give you that immersive audio feel 
but also cloud-based gaming is huge. We saw that in, uh, in, the, in the media slide that Steve presented that a lot of uh, traditional tech companies are becoming more involved in the media space. And that's the same thing for cloud-based gaming. We're seeing companies like Apple and Microsoft and Google launching their own platforms for cloud-based gaming. Yeah, that's true. And when you look at esports, we're going to feature a lot of programming related, relative to esports over at C-Space, again, where, where content is king uh, and our home for content at, at CES. And the point I want to make with esports is, as Leslie mentioned, it's, it's a, a billion dollar industry and growing brands are, are sponsoring. And, and I think it was from our research study, uh, about half a billion dollars in prize money has been awarded in esports since 2016, if memory serves. So a lot of money. So if you have a teenager at home and they're playing games in the basement, you may say, hey, go out there and enter some contests and make, make us rich because you can win a heck of a lot of money in some of these contests. Yeah, you can even but, major in it in college, too. Well, well true, yeah. They, they, they can pay for their own college, and you can go to, I don't know, Italy uh, or somewhere, or the vacation destination of your choice, and it doesn't have to be virtual. All right. We, uh, we can't address trends of CES without confronting uh, transportation and just all the things that are happening there. We, we could talk for probably half an hour at least on a lot of the transportation trends uh, that, are, that are happening out there. But let me just unpack, to use a very American term, uh, unpack a, a few of the, these trends for you uh, briefly. Uh, where is automotive and, and broader mobility and transportation at CES? Well, it's over at LBCC again, Tech East in North Hall. Long been described as a, as a show within a show. What's happening there? Well, first and foremost, electrification. So we all know about electric vehicles, but we're, we're finally at that inflection point where electrification makes a lot of sense. In fact, I think that this is the electric decade for vehicles. And that's not just cars, but, but all types of transportation. This is the electric decade for vehicles, make no mistake. And so why is electrification uh, happening? Why are we at that inflection point where it makes sense? Well, innovation in battery systems, uh, faster charging, longer charge, they hold the charge longer or store more. That speaks to range, better kilometers or mileage range. Uh, electric motor innovation, engineering thereof, more powerful, faster, better, more endurance. And charging systems. We've got to charge these things up somehow. Lots of innovation happening with them, safer, easier to use, and we tend to have more of them finally today. So not just at home, but at the airport, at the office, different places. You've seen what I'm talking about. So more opportunities infrastructure-wise to plug in and top up the power in our electric vehicles. So EVs are going to be a big story of CES 2020, and that's really setting the pace for the broader decade. Again, the electric decade for vehicles this, this decade. Which leads me to self-driving fleets, which all of which uh, uh, self-driving vehicles are electric. This is another focus area for CES over the past several years, whether we're talking about sensor innovation, LiDAR, ultrasonic, optical sensors or cameras, all these things, sensor fusion, the processing of all this data, just massive amounts of data, mapping data, all coming together. Of course, we're going to write a new chapter of innovation for all those things at CES 2020. But we're also starting to see from all the, the <laughs> testing that is going on on roads around the world to we're starting to turn to commercial deployments. And these are slowly been rolling out around the world. But I think, again, at the threshold of the new decade, we're going to start to see more and more commercial deployments. Uh, it starts here at CES 2020. And when we're talking commercial deployments, Leslie, we're talking fleets uh, of vehicles. And uh, Leslie, I think you're a Game of Thrones fan, if I remember correctly. I am. Correctly. I already miss it. And what would Jon Snow say if he were to attend CES and go into North Hall? All right, bear with us. Fleets are coming. Yes, fleets are coming. We tried. Yeah, maybe winter too. What kind of winter's already here? So uh, the, the fleets are coming, but uh, for sure. And, and what do fleets mean? Well, fleets mean partnerships. And that's another great point for CES. I mean, we hear about more and more partnerships each and every year at CES. This will be a hot spot for that. So nobody can do it alone. You've got to have a, a, a vehicle OEM. You've got to have a software developer, a, an operator. So all these groups coming together to make these fleets happen. Really quickly, cellular vehicle to everything, or CV to X. This is where we, we put that connected car or these contexts. We overlay with 5G. 
We'll hear about how that's going to develop and grow again as those networks propagate. And last but not least, multimodal transportation. So really, I think the, the emblematic technology for, for this trend is the almost omnipresent scooter uh, that we, we see just all around cities uh, around the world. And, and in our research that we've done, our consumer research at CTA, kind of illustrates this as uh, it, it's kind of a love-hate. Either people love them or they just don't like them, and they're not going to ride about riding that thing. No way. Uh, but people who do, like, I, I, I go on all day long. I love it. Why is all this happening? Why do we have more and more of this innovation that is addressing the first and last mile or kilometer, depending on where you live? It has to do, folks, with urbanization. Urbanization. Our, our cities are becoming more populated. And it's just not feasible for us to continue down the line of let's just, you know, honey, let's just hop in the car and we'll just keep, or we'll get on the train or the bus. We, we need more and more solutions uh, to help move us around these dense urban areas that are getting denser. But that's not all. So whilst we've seen a lot of innovation addressing the first and last mile, CES 2020 will really illustrate how innovation is starting to address the next mile addressing the next mile. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what we're talking about are electric vertical takeoff and landing craft. Now you see why we can just say flying car. Uh, it's a lot easier. That's more the technical term, but already this was a thing, if you like, at CES 2019 with the Bell Nexus. There are going to be more craft like this, uh, and uh, all of them electric, and there are talk, a lot of these companies are talking, again, this is another area where it's going to take partnerships. Uh, a lot of people are talking about commercial deployments in different places around the world, maybe around the middle part of this decade. So this is another story that's going to be very exciting. Billions of dollars of investment pouring into this space, more and more brands, some of them traditional car brands. Uh, looking at this space, we'll learn all about it at CES 2020. Okay, so switching gears, uh -oh. Good, okay, you got you. you got Good transition. Uh, digital health is one of my favorite areas of CES. As we start this new decade, we're finding that digital health is becoming more of a lifestyle. This year at CES 2020, there are over 150 exhibitors in this space alone. And we're seeing it touch on every aspect of our lives. So it's not just the relationship between a patient and their provider, you're able to bring some of these technologies home. And we'll see some of the traditional uh, products that we've seen over the past few years and see the innovations like with Fitbit and Omron and Philips, which have um, great innovations. But we're finding this year that over a third of US households own at least one wearable, and that number is growing. So people really want to take hold of their health unique to CES is that we're also showing the flip side of obtaining some of these products. So we have folks from Cigna, from Humana, some of the payers and insurance providers here at the show this year showing how they're helping people obtain these products that otherwise they might not have been able to get. Additionally, we're also going to see a lot of innovations within sleep technology. And I don't know about you, Steve. I think we're all going to need some extra help with the sleep area this week with all the excitement. I can use it this week, yes. speaking for myself. Yeah, that's right. So uh, sleep technology, there's a lot going into this space. You know, we talk about 5G, we talk about artificial intelligence, and biometrics. Biometrics is huge in the sleep technology space. So being able to track how your body um, acts throughout the night um, and enhancing your sleep, that's one of the areas that we'll be able to experience at the show floor. And also family technology. And when I speak about family technology, it's everything from baby technology, so wearables for your, for your infant or small child that tracks their vitals while they're sleeping in their crib, to also what we kind of term mommy tech as well. So a lot of, mom. Yeah, a lot of parenting tech will be on the show floor as well. Well, it's true, and, and just to, again, expand on Leslie's remarks, I think when it comes to digital health and what we will witness at, at CES 2020, uh, CES, as you guys know, is, is where the entire technology ecosystem comes together, and we can, we can touch and feel this stuff, and we can talk about it. And digital health, I think, is a really good example of, a, of an ecosystem of ecosystems. Uh, so a lot of, lot of innovation is, as Leslie mentioned, on the, on the payer front, down to the consumer level, all of these things really coming together 
Uh, and that's mostly over at TechWest, I believe. Mostly over at TechWest, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it gets better, right? Yeah, great. So going along with digital health, we're seeing a lot of more physicians and caretakers using some of these technologies. It's extending care to folks remotely. It's improving outcomes so you're able to send data to your doctor in real time. It's advancing medical uh, care. So for example, being able to use AI to diagnose specific diseases or cancer detection much earlier than a human can. Uh, providing remote monitoring. Steve spoke a little bit about this earlier when we talked about 5G connectivity. 5G is very important when it comes to healthcare monitoring because you want to be able to talk to hospitals in real time and get patient data in real time. So there's a lot of AI-assisted diagnosis, augmented MDs, and also that remote monitoring. Yeah, more human-machine partnerships, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. And for the second year in a row, CES is offering continuing medical education credits for attending physicians at the Disruptive Innovations in Healthcare track this Thursday. So moving on to resilient technologies, this is an ever-growing space of importance for CES. So what resilient technologies are, it's helping communities around the globe prepare for, recover from disasters or different um, things like wildfires, tsunamis, uh, cyber resiliency is in the space, public alert systems. Uh, my favorite example is the use of drones for uh, search and rescue missions. So instead of sending a human in a helicopter to, like, within a, a wildfire zone, um, you're able to send a drone up instead. So you're taking the human out of that dangerous scenario, and you're able to send up technology instead to find that missing person or analyze that area of the wildfire. New this year, uh, CES and the World Bank are launching their Global Tech Challenge. And what this means is that they're, they're putting out a call for companies to come showcase their resilient technologies and highlight how they're becoming uh, more uh, advanced in this space. And when we think of resilient technologies, we also have to think about sustainability. What happens when we get knocked off the grid? What do we do then? How can we use technology to help us uh, get back on track? And a great place to experience uh, this is at Eureka Park. Uh, well said, Leslie, and, and that's, that's true, because when you're looking at, at the green technology, sustainable technologies, a lot of innovation is happening at, at that tech startup level, as Leslie said. 1,200 tech startups in Eureka Park. And just to, want to give a shout out to our friends from Holland who are bringing about 50 tech startups to CES 2020. These are three uh, tech startups from, from Holland that are really focused on that uh, genre of sustainability and, and renewables and so forth. So Coolfinity that, that has a refrigerator that takes six hours of power for 24 hours of cooling. Scoon has this enormous like sea carton battery that can be used to power different things in different locations, again, if the grid goes out or, or otherwise. And Hyperloop, not a vending machine, it, it kind of may look like that, but it's actually a, a, a unit that helps recycle breakwater. That reduces uh, water use, uh, recycles it for watering the lawn and some other things, cleans it up. So, so really interesting. So if sustainability is really your thing, I urge you to go over to Eureka Park, if I can get my words out, uh, and check out some of these startups, for sure. Okay, we have a, a few minutes remaining, and we want to close with a, a fan favorite, and that is robotics. Uh, a lot of folks really look forward to the incredible, shocking, uh, some people may say cool, some people may say creepy, uh, innovations that we always see in robotics. And over the past 10 years, we've seen a ton of innovation in task-based systems, and that's just, these are systems that do one thing, and, and emblematic of that is like the, the robotic vacuum that we're all familiar with. At the same time, uh, several years ago, we started to see this, this undercurrent of innovation addressing more what was described back then and still today as social robots. So these were robots that did all kinds of different things. And a lot of them moved around and some, some of them walk. And, and you can still see these, these devices uh, at C CES this year. But these, these products have really struggled to find a marketplace. Yes, they can do a lot of different things, but why do I need that? Well, what would be the exact use case? Boy, that sure is expensive. I don't know. So some of the early movers in that space, which is a commentary on a lot of things that we tend to see uh, at CES, innovations, the stickiness of innovation uh, is, is what we're witnessing here. But 
Let me just ask a, a question really quickly, uh, another Jedi mind trick for you. Does anybody know what this is? I turned my, turn my desk. Okay, so, so this is the mouse droid uh, from Star Wars. Now, what <laughs> the heck does this thing do? So, and indulge me for, for a second. So let, let's say you're on the board of directors of the Empire, right? And you, you've awarded this multi-billion dollar, hundreds of billions of dollar project to build this brand new facility. The, the marketing geniuses have come up with this really cool name. It's called the Death Star. That's awesome. That's awesome. And you had to hire thousands and thousands of employees to staff this thing. And yes, a lot of them are dressed in white and carry blaster rifles, but that's beside the point. Nobody knows how to get from a turbo laser to a docking bay in this enormous s facility in the shape of a small moon. Nobody knows how to get around. Well, enter the mouse droid. So the point I'm coming to is that even in a galaxy far, far away, there was still a use case for just a simple task-based system. Isn't that right, Wesley? Yeah, let's bring it back to Earth a little bit, Steve. So not with the Star Wars jokes, which... But thank you for indulging that. Yeah, thank you. Let's move on a little bit. Uh, so as Steve mentioned, there is a robot for nearly every task. Everything from delivery robots that use biometrics to uh, unlock your package from a delivery robot. Uh, the Breadbot was a big hit last year at CES 2019 because, hey, who doesn't like carbs? I mean, I love them. Uh, and then Foldmate as well. Fold your clothes. A robot that folds your clothes. It's great. And this week during CES and at your hotel even, you'll likely see some of these robots cutting around your hotel, what we like to call concierge robots. So you can order your morning Starbucks and have it delivered directly to your room via robot. And <laughs> now I want a cup of coffee really bad. Yeah. Might have to pay a couple of hundred dollars for that. Yeah. Delivery fee. Yeah, that's right. And as Steve mentioned, social robots are really hitting the ground. So we see a lot of different uses for these social robots. Warney is a great example. It educates children on a variety of activities. So there's robots out there that are teaching children different languages, teaching them STEM coding. The Tombot, the robotic dog, it's a, it's a far, far cry from the Tombot that I had back in the 90s. But uh, the, Tom, <laughs> the Tombot robot dog is a companion robot uh, for patients. And then, of course, Priya Black Black and Decker, it's really cool. So what it is, is it's an electronic pill dispensing robot. <laughs> it uses biometrics and facial recognition, so it, 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 dis it dispenses the right medication for the right person at the right time. And you're able to share that data with your caregiver. Yeah, just to add a little bit of perspective. So as I mentioned, you know, social robots have kind of struggled to find a home, if you, if you like, in more recent years. And a lot of them walk around and move around. Well, as you can tell, all these social robots are stationary. So, so that's one thing in, in these things. And then, really, when you add mobility to any robotic system, that elevates costs big time. So that keeps costs down. But where innovation is really leaning in and really focusing on when it comes to social robots is the human-machine interaction. The interaction. So, and, and the Prius system is, is a really good example. And this is not just for fun and games, but really for, for digital health purposes, that, that has real meaning for if you have an aging loved one at home and you want the peace of mind to know that their medication was dispensed, the right ones were, were dispensed at least. And there's some interaction there so you can know that they actually took the medication. But, but also, I mean, who doesn't love the, the Tombot robotic dog? I mean, that, that's such an adorable, but for treating people, uh, seniors with Alzheimer's or something, kind of a, a care dog, using robots, again, focusing on the human-machine interaction. Okay. And we've seen a lot of people taking photos. All these slides are going to be available. We probably should have told you that right off the gate. <laughs> we, we, didn't, we didn't say this in the beginning because we, we wanted to see everybody rising out of their seats. And now you've got like 50 yeah. photos of us. So feel, feel free to put those on Facebook yeah. and social media. We can yeah. endorse that. Don't forget to tweet all the photos on slides. Tag us for uh, but you can find all the slides that we presented today on CTA's website at www.cta.tech.